Michael, you are an expert in focus on transhumanism and transhumanism to really understand it, the foundation is the nature of consciousness. So uh, I'd like to understand your and also the Catholic Church's approach to the concept of consciousness, not that they're different, but may have different ways of describing it, uh, as to the, the fundamental essence of what consciousness is. When we speak about the essence of consciousness, it's very common to start with a description of our experience of sentience and awareness when we wake up that continues through our day until we go to sleep. And I think that that's generally a helpful starting point also to indicate that there are certain characteristics of consciousness that we usually experience, such as this interiority, this subjectivity, this qualitative dimension. As a Catholic and as a Catholic priest, this inner life of consciousness fascinates me uh, because it's also a place of encounter, a place where we encounter the Lord, God, the divine, also a place that opens us to a deeper understanding of ourselves, of our progress in the moral, the spiritual life, and a place where we can assess other relationships. Now, interestingly enough, the, the church does not actually have a lot of concrete dogmas or theological teachings about consciousness. Consciousness is a reality that's also shared with other non-human animals. It's not something exclusive to us as human beings, but there are some fascinating dimensions about our way of experiencing consciousness as rational animals that do have a lot to do with this journey through life and also this journey of moral growth and the different sorts of relationships I mentioned. And that would differentiate us, the con our consciousness from non-human animal consciousness? Yes, I, I think that that emphasis on intersubjectivity and interpersonal relationship is a, a dimension that really stands out when it comes to human consciousness. But I wouldn't want to le lose sight of this continuity between human consciousness and animal consciousness. I would want to preserve, and I would say also the church would want to preserve an appreciation for our animality, for our embodiment. And so I think that while it's very helpful to start with these broad definitions of consciousness to give us some sense of what we're dealing with, it's also very helpful to identify perhaps different layers of consciousness. So I might speak of a very basic perception of my inner states of hunger, of thirst, which is important for homeostasis and for survival. I might also speak of a perception of outward realities of, of sense data, seeing, hearing, touching. But then I also find that there is a certain perceptual integration. So I, I do not experience all of these sense data points as a, an overwhelming barrage, but I, I'm actually able to come up with a coherent uh, picture of the world that helps me to navigate. But then there's also the whole fascinating dimension, not only of my consciousness of the external world, but also of a certain awareness of my own thoughts, my own feelings. I, I seem to be also embodied in this world. I have this sense of position, of movement, of directionality. When we come to self-consciousness, I think we see a bit more clearly this distinction from the other non-human animals. If before there's a certain continuity, here we seem to come to something that's quite unique and fascinating. And so now we have this ability to turn in on ourselves, to know ourselves as knowers, and also to reflect upon our past and even to critically assess it, perhaps to relish what we've accomplished or perhaps even to reject, regret, or, or repent of that and then look forward to plan and chart a whole course of action. And in that realm of self-understanding, we also find ourselves with different available options. So I think this moral agency is another dimension that emerges when we explore consciousness that, that seems to distinguish us as human beings and open up a whole plane of development and growth.
You, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, what I like to immediately get to is how does that happen? What kinds of mechanisms, I know even as pure physical as scientists don't know the answer to that. Right. But, you know, as a, a, a priest in the Catholic Church and as, a, as a, uh, an intellectual yourself, when you see this distinction between humans with the, the moral sense and the interrelationships and animals both having the basic, shall we say, phenomenal consciousness of the sensations or the perceptions, but having this difference, uh, how, how does that literally happen? How, do you, how can you make that happen? That's a great question. I think that when we're looking at how this consciousness happens, we want on the one hand to respect that embodiment, this animality, this continuity with non-human animals, but also account for these certain experiences that, that distinguish us. So in the church really leaves us a lot of room to explore the neurophysiological basis of many of these aspects of consciousness. And I would personally be inclined to some sort of emergentist um, explanation that this complex biological system allows for the emergence of certain properties that we cannot find in, in lower beings. And that would have to be a purely neurophysiological, neuroanatomical uh, analysis, that emergence occurring from? I would certainly be attentive to all of those elements. I would also look at how the, the organism interacts with its environment and what role that interaction with the environment plays. So I'm very interested in developments both in embodied cognition and in, in activism and how that perhaps can bring us to a, a fuller picture of this matter. And certainly uh, neurobiological and then embodied in an activism uh, and activism is are, are part of a broader scale. There may be other things as well. Mm -hmm. um, but does that leave you without residue? Is there anything else that you need? I know that the church teaches an immortal soul or soul. Right. Is, is, is that a part? Do you need something of that non-physical element to uh, energize or to en en enliven this neurobiological or embodied uh, uh, coalition? Yes, so while there's the sensitivity to the physical dimension, I would want to preserve and affirm some sort of non-physical principle. It has been long-standing tradition in the church to speak of a soul, but the reflection on the soul is something that predates the church. We can go to Plato or Aristotle, and I think it's, it's very helpful for all people, whether they're Catholic or not, uh, to appreciate that this is not some sort of spooky, ghost-like reality, but rather, as Aristotle understood, a principle of living beings. And I think that, like Aristotle and many other thinkers, Thomas Aquinas within the, the Catholic tradition have affirmed, there are different levels of soul. And so we, we may have certain souls that are capable of actions that cannot be accounted for strictly through uh, physical organs. And so I would hold that the human person is capable of certain acts that indicate the presence of a non-material, immaterial soul. And traditionally, those acts tend to be associated with conceptual thought, with abstraction, with that move from the particular all of the particulars that sensation offers to the universal, to that which can be instantiated in many different ways in many different time periods, as well as this moral agency, this sense that we can evaluate different alternatives. We can deliberate and then choose those, and we may be profoundly conditioned by all of our biophysical characteristics, conditioned by our environment, but not determined. There's still this realm of freedom and ability to choose one or the other after evaluation or to choose not to choose. And this non-physical component, if you will, is unique to human beings and not present in any animals? I other? would, yes, I would say that this, that the, there are different souls, Aristotle, Aquinas, and others speak of vegetative souls proper to plants, that these, this principle of unity that basically accounts for why something is living and not living, why there's growth 
and nutrition and movement. And then he would speak of animal souls. So why is it that certain living beings also are capable of sensation? And then we would speak of an immaterial soul, which would be what grounds these very particular human actions, especially abstract thought and rational moral agency.